glory. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, if you love Jesus, give him praise this morning. Amen. Amen. It's hard not to worship. You can't worship when you don't know who he is. I'm just going to be real. We have to engage. Amen? Listen, if, if you've never worshipped God before, I want to encourage you this morning that he yearns to see you worship him. Amen? Despite what's going on in your life, despite what's happening, maybe something happened this morning. Forget about it. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. Just worry about this morning. Amen? Worry about this morning. Come on, give them praise. Give them praise this morning. Hallelujah. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God, of our praise. You're worthy, God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for what's about to take place this morning. As soon as we walk through them doors, things begin to happen. Feelings begin to rise up. Emotions that you haven't felt in a while begin to take place. It feels like home. It feels like home this morning. Father, I just pray that you move powerfully this morning. Shake our lives. Shake our lives this morning, God. As we praise you, as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, church.
to you on Monday the same way we did on Sunday. We surrender to you. You are better. You are so much greater. We say yes to you this morning, Jesus. You are beautiful and good. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. We're going to move into tithe and offering. So if I can get the ushers to come forward. I was sharing with Gavin last night. I was just telling him I'm so grateful. Just looking at, he's he's been working a lot and a lot of extra hours. And we were just talking about how grateful we are for all that God has provided us with. All that he's done for us. And we see his goodness every day. And, and out of that gratitude, we should want to give back. We should want to bless others because God has blessed us. So as we pray over the tithe, I challenge you, seek God. Is there somebody he's calling you to bless? Is there something that he's speaking to you specifically about your tithe, specifically about offering, about meeting the need of, of this church or somebody in this church? Let's be sensitive to God's voice. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for all that you've given us. You are so wonderful and good, so faithful, such a good provider. And we just pray over this tithe, Lord. I pray that it would go to further your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you would bless the giver. Speak to us, Lord. Help us to pour out even just a fraction of what you have given us, what you have poured out on us, Lord. Help us to be obedient when you speak, Lord. Jesus name amen. Amen. Sierra is going to give us some announcements. Good morning his touch family. I have <laughs> I have just a couple um April 20th we have a hearts of seniors ministry um bring your favorite dish for some spring games and fellowship. That sounds like fun. I love games. And then May 18th, we have a spring cleaning and church work day at 9 a.m. All hands on deck for that. That would be great. And then if you have not heard about the fishing trip fundraiser, that Juan and Addie were so kind and generous to donate to the church. All the funds are going to the AC. Praise Jesus. So um, if y'all have any questions about that, just reach out. Um, and then if y'all want to stand up and show some people some love and hug their neck, Pastor Dave will be up here in just a minute.
four. Don't forget to stop by the welcome booth on the, in the uh, entryway. Uh, we have some information for you. We'd like to get to know you more. If you don't have a home church, uh, we would love and uh, be honored if you'd consider making this your home church. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I want to go ahead and uh, just say how awesome last Sunday was. If you missed last Sunday, we had 15 people uh, follow our Lord in baptism. Amen. Amen. That was exciting. That was, that was really exciting. You know, baptism is a public declaration of a private decision that you've already made. In other words, baptism doesn't save you. Okay? You're saved through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But what baptism does, it's a public declaration, and you're telling the world uh, that you're a follower of Jesus and, and that you intend to serve him. You know, no matter what happens in this life, you tend to keep, you, you, you've intended in your heart to keep the cross before you and the world behind you, right? And I remember when I was baptized, how excited I was. You know, I was just, I was filled with determination. I remember that. I remember thinking, you know, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to the way I was. I don't want to go back to my old life. I wanted to know everything I could about Jesus, you know. And I had an excitement, and I, and I saw that excitement so much on the people that were being baptized. And here's what happens a lot of times, though. A lot of times is that the world, inter- you know, the world intrudes back into your life, okay? And, you know, you, you have a determination, but then at the same time, you, you have problems that you're still working on. You, you have, you know, problems that, that, are, that are happening in your life. You still have temptations coming on. And the unfortunate thing is very often, that's exactly when the devil decides to bring an attack in your life when you're feeling up here, you know? And it's because once you've hit that spiritual milestone or you've had a, a spiritual experience, you kind of let your defenses down, you know? And you're not really expecting an attack because you're feeling so good and you're so determined that, you know, you're going to serve Jesus, C.S. Lewis wrote a book. It was called The Screwtape Letters. And in that book, The Screwtape Letters, uh, it's a fictional story. It's not a real story. It's a fictional story about a demon named Wormwood. And he's a junior tempter, okay? And his job was to, or his task, rather, was to keep a young man from the Lord. That was his job. And he's advised by a, a, an uncle named Screwtape. Uh, Screwtape is a, a higher-ranking demon, and he's like part of the administration. His job is to help Wormwood in his tempting of this young new believer. And what he says, he says, uh, uh, his, uh, Screwtape advises his nephew to sow seeds of doubt in the minds of new believers, right? Casting uncertainty on the existence of heaven, and then they can weaken the foundation of the faith. So many times after a spiritual victory, uh, that's when the devil will begin to sow thoughts of doubt, temptation. He'll try to direct our attention elsewhere. And and here's the thing. How does he do that? He does that here, okay? The battle is in the mind. That's where it is. The battle is in the mind. The battle between flesh and soul, the battle between worldliness and spirit, between heaven and hell are waged in the mind. So I want to talk this morning about winning the war in your mind. So join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I praise you and give you glory. I love you, Father God, because we are to take every thought captive and bring it into obedience to Christ. We are to change how we think. We are to change, you know, our beliefs that we had before and align them with the word of God. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit guides and helps us as as we walk this walk of faith. I pray protection from the enemy, and I pray that in this service, Lord, that we're transformed. I I pray that the word of God goes forth and just does what the word of God does best, and that's transform our minds and conforms us into the image of Christ. And I praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Proverbs 23 and 7 This was my father-in-law's favorite verse. He would say it uh, a lot of times. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And he would tell me that a lot of times. You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, he becomes what he thinks. So I go back, I, I read Proverbs, and the Proverbs 23, it specifically 
the context of it specifically warns about the deception of a stingy host, okay? He invites you to come to his house, and he, he invites you to eat and drink, and he tells you, eat as much as you want, drink as much as you want, but deep down, he doesn't really feel that way. He's actually counting the cost of everything that you're eating, and he's, he, he, on the outside, he seems like he's generous, but on the inside, he's really stingy. And the, ver- and the verse is really that a person's true character, okay, is revealed by what they think in their heart, okay? Not by what they say in their mouth. And the verse implies you need to be careful of people who pretend to be generous but are actually selfish. So I was reading that, and that's the immediate context of that verse, but there's an important universal truth, okay? In other words, there's a truth that transforms the immediate context, and that is this. What you think will determine your character. What you think will lead you to who and what you will become. What you think will determine how you react to situations, how you feel about the circumstances that you find yourself in, how you think colors how you experience the world. So in a Christian faith, a lot of times, you know, there's a battle in our minds, between faith and doubt. We want to have faith, but doubt sometimes creeps in. When doubt creeps in, if we entertain that doubt and we think about that, then our faith lessens. We want to trust God. We want God to take control of our lives. We want God to, to be the one that directs our paths and our, and, and our steps. But there's a natural inclination for us to want to remain in control. Can we really trust God with our lives? Or, or do I need to help God along? We have a confidence in our calling, but at the same time, we have an insecurity. You know, can I really you know, do this thing that God has called me to do? You know, Paul struggled with that very thing. In Romans chapter 7, beginning of verse 14, he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree the law is good, and it is, But it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. In other words, Paul's saying, I want to do the right thing, but I find myself doing the wrong thing. I want to do this, but I find myself doing that. See, the most of the life's battles are won and fought here in your mind. But the good news, the good news is that God's word is powerful. The good news is God's word will not just help you, but will transform and renew your mind with the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. I want you to keep that in your mind for something later on. The Bible says that as Christians, we're to put on the full armor of God, part of which is the helmet of salvation, which we are told is the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ, which means that we are to begin to think like Jesus thought. So our first principle today is our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What we tend to think about comes out in our life. Science and scripture agree with this. There's been a lot of research on cognitive behavior, psychology, and it shows that a lot of the problems that we have in our lives, a lot of the things that we struggle with come down to wrong thought processes. 
some of our relational challenges, some, some of our eating disorders, some addictions, some anxieties, they actually are a direct result of toxic thinking. That's what science says. Science says that every thought creates a neurochemical reaction or change in your body. And what's so interesting is the more you think a certain thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. And once you think a thought enough and you create those neural pathways in the brain, the more often you think that thought, the more that connection is there, the easier it is to think that thought again. And before long, whatever it is that we've been entertaining, whatever it is we've been thinking about the most, that becomes our default thought. So if you believe something for long enough, you start to be impacted by that as if that's something were true and you get stuck in a rut. See, if you walk out in your front yard and you start walking across your lawn and you do this every day for 100 days, you just walk straight across your lawn, eventually what you're going to cause is a path. You're going to cause a path to be generated there and there's not going to be anything that grows. So if you think in your mind something for 100 days straight, okay, what's going to happen? You're going to create a pathway, and that's going to become your default. That's how you're going to view the world. That's going to be the default position that you have. And everything that happens is going to be colored through how you think about things. So what happens if you stop walking on the grass? If you, if you go off that path, eventually the grass grows back. So if you do that, that's why habits are so hard to break, right? A habit forms because our thoughts translate into action. Our action done over and over and over again translate into default behavior. So we build up strongholds in our minds the more we entertain negative thoughts. And that becomes our default way of seeing the world. So our life is often a reflection of the thoughts we think. And what we think determines who we become. You know, if you think you'll never be able to do something, if you think you don't have the ability, you're not good enough, you don't have what it takes, if you think you can't, then you probably can't. If you think you can, then by the grace of God, you probably will. You have two ways of seeing things. You can see challenges in your life as obstacles that cannot be overcome. Or you can view challenges in your life as an opportunity for God to do something great in your life. The choice is yours. If you dwell on problems, the world is bad, it's getting worse, those problems are going to overwhelm you. But if you look for solutions... If you believe you can have faith and you can find solutions, then you'll see faith arise. If you always feel like you're a victim, you will be a victim. But instead, if you believe that you can overcome by the power of Christ, then you can overcome. It's a reflection of what we think. And I love what Paul writes in his letter to the Romans Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He could change that. We could probably change that to be, don't conform to the wrong ways of thinking, but instead be conformed to the things of God. In other words, don't think about the things of the world, but think about the things of God. That's what it means to be transformed. The more your thoughts are on the things of this world, then the more you will be conformed to the things of this world. And the simple truth, here's the simple truth. We're all born conformed to the things of this world. That's our default position. Until we come to Jesus, until we understand the truth 
of who God is, and we accept Jesus is our Savior, our minds are reprobate, is what the Bible says. We have a worldly mind. It takes the gospel to open our eyes to the truth. That's why Paul says to be transformed. Paul doesn't say to be conformed to a new way of thinking, but he says for us to be transformed, which means a new way of thinking. That's what it means to repent. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And a lot of times we see repentance or we think of repentance as feeling sorry for something. We feel bad because we did X and Y. And we believe that repentance is saying sorry. That's actually not what repentance actually means. What repentance actually means is to change our mind. Not just to change our mind about a situation, but to change completely how our mind actually works. We are to have a new way of thinking about the world. And it leads to the second principle, and that second principle is that you cannot have a positive life if you have a negative mind. Come on, we've, we've, we've been around people that have a negative mind, and you kind of want to avoid them. You don't want to because you're a Christian. And you want to be available, but every time <laughs> that you're with them, Every time, well, you just end up feeling worse when you're done than before. Because you can tell that they don't have a positive life because everything they think about is negative. Everything that they experience is bad. And everything in their life is colored by that negativity that they have in their mind. And Satan knows this. So his strategy is to shape your thinking one thought at a time. To trap you in a prison of his lies. And if you continue to harbor a negative mind, it will build a stronghold in your life. Satan will tell you, you can't trust God. Look at your life. How often have you prayed about this and it's still, he hasn't answered your prayer yet. Nobody, nobody can take care of you like you. Satan will tell you, you'll never succeed at anything. You failed at everything you've ever tried. Why do you even bother? Satan will say, you're always broke. You're always going to be broke. You're never going to be anything but broke. And you'll harbor that and develop a mindset that tells you that you'll never have anything more than what you have now. The devil will tell you, your marriage is falling apart. It can't be fixed. Might as well just leave that fool now. Might as well just walk out that door now because it's never going to be no good. And the devil will tell you, God doesn't hear your prayers. Why are you wasting your time for? God knows who you were. God knows what you've done. You think he's going to listen to you? The devil will tell you, God doesn't care. The devil will tell you, you'll never make a difference in this world. And if you hear a lie enough and you entertain that lie enough, then that lie will begin to sound like the truth. And you'll start thinking, yeah, I can't trust God. I'll never succeed. My marriage is over. can't be fixed. 
God doesn't hear what I pray. I'll never make a difference. If you entertain his lies, you'll build a stronghold up in your mind. So what's the answer? What's the answer to it? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-4. through four. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Whatever stronghold has been built up in your mind, we have divine power to demolish those strongholds. That's why we need to be transformed according to Paul because it's only the word of God that has the ability to transform our worldly minds so that we set our sights on the things that are above and not on what is below. Remember I told you to remember 2 Corinthians. That verse in 2 Corinthians says what? It says take every thought captive. That word, captive, is a military word. It's a military term. means to capture with a sword or a spear. Now, we're told to put on the full armor of God, right? If you go through and you look at the full armor of God, every piece of that armor is defensive in nature. The belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, all of those things are defensive meant to protect you from the attack of the enemy. But there is one offensive weapon. There is one offensive piece of the armor. There's one thing that you can use to go on the offensive against the enemy, and that is the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. When we transform our minds and we focus on the things of the world, or not on the things of the world, but we focus on the things of the God, we'll be able to live our identity in Christ. Understand that if we believe Satan's lies, we'll never be who we are supposed to be. We'll never be victorious over the attacks of the enemy if we believe the lies that the enemy tells And the only way that we are going to know the truth is to know the truth. See, too often we neglect this and we don't know what God says. And if we don't know what God says, if we don't know his promises to us, then it's like going into battle without a sword. Yeah, your helmet might help you when the devil's bonking you on the noggin but it ain't going to feel good. You might be able to take your shield and extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy, but maybe one or two of those darts get in because you're too busy moving like this. You need the sword of the Spirit to go on the offensive. You need to know the promises of God that he has given you. You need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know that you are not who you think you are, but you have become a new creation in Jesus Christ. When we come to Christ, when we accept him as our our Savior, the Bible says that we become new creations. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. And the Holy Spirit becomes entwined with our spirit, and we are made something completely new. And he joins us into the body of Christ so that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. You have a new identity. So you need to start focusing on God's stuff. But to do that, you'll have to learn some stuff and unlearn some other stuff. In other words, when you're given a new identity, you need to have a new way of thinking. A new way of of seeing the world. A new way of of experiencing your experiences every every day. Remember, your thoughts color how you react to actions and, and, and situations and things that happen in your life. Your thoughts color. Everything about life is a reflection of how you think about things. 
If you think worldly things, then what you're thinking about are the things of the here and now. And that's it. But when you begin to translate that and ask yourself what's truly important, and what truly is important is the things that last. And what lasts? Does this world last? We spend so much time thinking about the things of the world, but Jesus said what? This world and everything in it. Look around you. Everything you see, everything that we grasp for, everything that we think is important, everything that the world says we need is not going to last. But Jesus said, my word will last forever. You need a new way of thinking, and you have to be willing to walk in your identity. And the cool thing is when you begin to learn the new stuff, you begin to walk in this new identity, you'll find out everything begins to work out better. Everything starts to make more sense. I'm not saying that walking a Christian life is easy because we all know it's not easy. We all know that it would be so much better if we could come to Jesus and then we all live with fairy tales and unicorns and everything is wonderful in a big bubble of love. But we all know that doesn't happen. What actually happens is a lot of times the problems that we had before are magnified now because the things before that were worldly things that we thought about then, now all of a sudden Jesus says don't think about those things, don't do those things, and now all of a sudden you have to come up with a new way of living. And then you got the devil coming in and trying to trip you up, trying to whisper lies into your mind. You have to walk in your identity. It's not easy, but it's a journey worth taking. So I'm going to bring it to a conclusion this morning. I'm going to ask you, can you identify a stronghold that you've built up in your life? Can you identify some lie that the devil's told you that you've held on to and it's it's gotten into, into your spirit and you start seeing things and, and viewing things in that way? You know, one of the strongholds that can be built up in your life is bitterness. Maybe someone hurt you in the past. Maybe things didn't work out in your life the way that you had envisioned those things to work out, and it's made you bitter. And you've harbored that bitterness, and you've thought about that bitterness to the point to where now you don't just think about being bitter. You just became a bitter person. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thought. Maybe it's anger. You have a hard time controlling your anger to the point where you don't just have a hard time controlling your anger, you're just angry. You just became angry. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe that's a stronghold that's been built up. Someone hurt you, so now you've built a wall. A wall to protect you. To keep somebody from hurting you again. And by goodness, you're not going to forgive that person. And now you've made yourself a servant of the person that hurt you. Because I can guarantee you, you think about that person more than that person thinks about you. And it's coloring everything in your life and you can't let it go. You built that stronghold up in your life. Can you identify a stronghold in your life? You can't defeat what you don't know. If you can identify that stronghold, do you know the truth that demolishes that stronghold? John 8, 32 says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I can't do this, you might be saying. I'm not strong enough to undergo this temptation. Jesus expects too much from me. I can't do it. 
No, no, no. My Bible says I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. I don't look like the people in the magazines. Everybody's told me that I'm ugly. I'm not attractive. My Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That you are a unique, wonderful, beautiful creation made by God and carrying within you the image of the one who created you. But I'm so depressed. I'm so lonely. I feel miserable. No, no, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that he is with us. That he's never leave us and never forsake us so that we're never alone. You don't understand, Pastor. I I just don't feel like I can overcome this. I don't feel like I can get over this. My Bible says that you are more than a conqueror through Christ who gives you strength. Life is always moving in the direction of your your biggest thought. And what comes to mind will come out in your life. You cannot have a positive life and a negative mind. You've got to capture Satan's lies got to capture those things and replace them with the truth of God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I praise you and give you glory and honor. I thank you so much, Father, for every good and perfect gift that comes from heaven above. We know that we can we can rely on you and we can trust in you. I pray, Father God, that you help us transform our minds. Give us a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing the world, viewing the world through the the eyes of the eternal and not the temporal. To give our, our minds focus on that which is truly important and not the things of this world that are passing away. Help us be overcomers, Father God, for there are strongholds built up in our lives that we just need to be demolished. We need your help to do that. We need your spirit to guide us and lead us We need the strength of Jesus Christ for the word of God says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We understand that this Satan is out in the world and he's roaming to and fro looking who he can destroy. Father, I pray that your angels encamp around us. I pray that there's warfare done in the spiritual realms. That we walk as conquerors in our new identity that we think differently, that we act differently, that we talk differently. That we transform our minds from the earthly thoughts that we had before to the heavenly thoughts that will guide us and direct us into the new life that you have. I praise you and give you glory. I'm gonna open the altars now and I'm gonna encourage you to come and get prayer. If you need anything from the Lord, he's here. He's present. If you're sick in body, he still heals today. If you're struggling with some of the things that I've talked about, you can be set free. For the word of God says he came to set the captive free. If you're wrapped up with thinking, that is a wrong way of of thinking. One prayer could transform your mind. Don't leave the same way that you came in. How much faith does it take? It takes enough to ask. In death in life, I'll follow you. In every season, this be true. Cause I chose this path And I made this vow And I will never turn around Because nothing can hold me Back from your love I'm following you, Jesus
to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'll give it all for love's true name. It brings my heart, now I will rise to bear the name. Cause I find my joy in bringing you praise. Come what may, and I will obey. Cause I find my joy in bringing you praise. Thank you.
church we're going to leave the altars open for a few minutes um, if you need prayer we're not going to leave we're going to stay uh, I'll stay as long as it takes uh, but for, for the rest of y'all I'll go ahead and pray a prayer of dismissal and uh, send you with the blessing of the Lord lift your hands to heaven this morning may the Lord bless you and protect you may the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you and may the Lord give you his favor and his peace as you leave God's house this morning. May you be blessed as you leave. May you be blessed as you return. God bless you guys, and we'll see you again next week. Hug somebody and let them know Jesus loves them before you leave today, amen. Oh